These last two weeks have been very chaotic and full of developments, and this one will prove to be no different. In the Solomons area, as the drive on Munda is finally starting, the Japanese will continue to attempt to reinforce their new Georgia defences, leading up to another deadly naval engagement, the Battle of Kolombangara. And in New Guinea, the successful establishment of the Nassau Bay beachhead will now allow General Savija's forces to carry out their final attack against Mubo in an effort to put great pressure on the Japanese base at Salamaua. Thus, join us as we delve into another exciting episode of the Pacific War. As you know, recently we started releasing extra videos as patron and YouTube member exclusives. After finishing the series on the Peloponnesian War, History of Prussia and Italian Wars of Unification, Risorgimento, we will start releasing our series on the First Punic War. For the next two months, starting this Saturday, we will release six videos on this fascinating conflict. You can become a YouTube member by pressing the Join button below or the link in the description. The Patreon link is in the description too. Patrons and YouTube members get early access to all videos, our schedule, exclusive access to our Discord where we're really active, wallpapers, and most importantly, access to more than 30 exclusive videos, with new ones added weekly. Becoming a YouTube member or patron supports our work. We appreciate all the support we're getting, so thank you. Despite the errors committed and the inexperience of General MacArthur's forces in amphibious operations, the Nassau Bay landing had been largely successful, allowing General Savige to get some much-needed reinforcements on his eastern flank, and also opening a new supply route for his troops. Yet the landing was only the stepping stone for a bigger offensive, called Operation Doublet, which aimed at dislodging the Japanese from their well-entrenched positions at Mubo and Bob Duby. By July 2nd, Brigadier Motten's plan was for the 2nd, 6th and 2nd, 5th battalions to attack and occupy the Mubo Observation Hill area, while the Taylor Force was to capture Bitoy Ridge and then occupy the ridge between Bui Alang and Bui Kumbo Creeks, finally making contact with the Australians to cut off the Japanese lines of communication along Bui Gap Creek. In the meantime, the 15th Brigade had already started its offensive though the Australians would see their efforts to be unexpectedly unsuccessful, getting delayed by the tenacious resistance of the Japanese defenders and suffering because of the inexperience of the 58th-59th Battalion. Its only positive result was that General Moria would request many reinforcements, so two companies of the 1st Battalion 80th Regiment would be sent from Leh, while Colonel Araki decided to send a company of his 1st Battalion. Thus, by early July, Moria counted with five infantry companies, 500 men in total. Additionally, Araki was so worried about the activity to the north that he would decide to leave only his second battalion at Mubo, moving all his remaining troops to Komiatum. Concurrently, on July 4th, Brigadier Heathcote Hammer assumed command of the 15th Brigade, bringing with him some fresh ideas from North Africa, but finding a very difficult situation on Bob Duby. Concerned by the delays, General Savige would deploy Major Worf's commandos to prevent the escape of the Japanese from Mubo. Vital for Savige's operation was also the position of B Company on the bench cut track, which would carry out two successful ambushes on July 5th and 6th, killing 20 enemy soldiers, despite the poor living conditions of the area. But even more important was the old Vickers position, where the Japanese had an artillery piece which would be used sporadically against the Australians. Consequently, C Company made a diversionary attack while D Company moved in to capture the coconuts, successfully occupying the northern area by nightfall. Yet the Japanese soon responded the following morning, with the 80th Regiment soldiers swiftly repelling the Australian militiamen. On the afternoon of July 7th, after an air attack by six Bostons, C Company finally charged the old Vickers position with D Company's mortars supporting them. But as the men moved up the steep, knife-edged approach into the fire of machine guns tunneled into the hill, they would only get to within 60 meters of the seemingly impregnable pillboxes. At the same time, the Japanese were beginning to counterattack on the southern edge of the ridge, successfully ambushing the Australian supply lines and inflicting many casualties. On July 9th, Another attack was attempted against Old Vickers through Sugarcane Knoll, but it likewise ended in defeat. 
and three days later, D Company tried to mount Old Vickers from the northwest, successfully climbing up the hill during the night, but then getting repelled the following morning. It looked like Bob Duby Ridge would be harder to take than expected, but at least Hammer managed to draw many Japanese units away from Mubo. Meanwhile, Moton's forces were ready to assault Mubo by July 6th, with three companies at Guaypal Creek, one at Lababia Ridge, one at the Saddle, and the remainder of the 2nd 5th Battalion in reserve. To further support this attack, Savige had directed Wharf's commandos to cut the Komiatum track at Goodview Junction, Yet on July 6th, Wharf's column would be spotted by Japanese patrols as they marched towards Wells Junction. Thus, the Japanese would attack from Oridubi, successfully ambushing the commandos at Ambush Knoll and making them lose some much-needed supplies and equipment. This ambush would force Wharf to counterattack, finally recovering his mortar and machine guns the following day before resuming their advance southwards. On the morning of July 7th, Morton's leading companies moved to their start line south of Observation Hill, wading waist-deep through Boyapo Creek in the heavy rain. The main assault was preceded by a series of heavy air attacks over Observation Hill and Kitchen Creek, which left the entire Mubo Valley enveloped in a thick pall of smoke. As the air attack finished, the ground troops moved forward, supported by artillery and mortar fire. Although the 2nd 5th Company managed to advance without encountering opposition, successfully climbing the northern slopes of Observation Hill, the other two would face strong resistance on the southern slopes, finally getting forced to establish defensive positions for the night. At the same time, the American artillery began to move inland from Nassau Bay, though the difficult weather and terrain would only allow them to arrive at Napier by July 8th. Finally, Taylor Force was instructed to occupy Bitoy Ridge, but the delay in the deployment of the artillery affected this. Nonetheless, Taylor's men were on the upper southern slopes of the ridge by 1500 hours, with A Company patrols forward on the crest. That morning, Colonel Wood's B Company also managed to break through to the north, then swinging southeast down the ridge to arrive at a point between Kitchen and Buisavella Creeks. Meanwhile, A Company tried another assault on Observation Hill, but was repelled by the tenacious Japanese defenders, prompting Wood to send Captain Dexter's D Company to reinforce them. Many patrol clashes occurred on July 9th, as the Australians moved deeper into Japanese territory, yet the enemy suddenly responded in the afternoon with a strong counterattack against the 2nd 5th Company, which forced Dexter to send a platoon to reinforce the defenders finally repelling the Japanese towards the jungle. More inconclusive but intrepid patrol activity followed on July 10th, with B Company engaging the enemy at Kitchen Creek and with the Americans discovering the Bowie Campbell Creek track that the enemy would use to withdraw to Mount Tambu. With the Australian infiltration clear, however, General Nakano would have to order the Mubo garrison to withdraw to Komiatum on July 11th. As immediate withdrawal was considered impossible, the Japanese would begin their retreat at sundown after repelling a number of attacks by the Australians, finally reaching the well-prepared positions along the saddle from Goodview Junction to Mount Tambu on July 13th. Yet the Japanese withdrawal was spotted by American patrols, which directed strong artillery fire to fall on them, thus inflicting heavy casualties but failing to block their escape. On July 12th, with the enemy gone at last, the Australians would be able to capture the Pimple, Green Hill and Observation Hill facing very little opposition. These actions meant that Mubo was finally in Australian hands, though Motten would still be disappointed that American infantry had been unable to hold an effective blocking position across the Japanese line of retreat. Through these actions, the Japanese would suffer 981 casualties between July 1st and 22nd, and against them, it's reported that the Australians lost around 300 men. With the fall of Mubo, General Savige now prepared to drive the Japanese over the Francisco River, still unaware that Salamaua was not to be taken before Ley. Meanwhile, in the Central Solomons, General Wing's forces were completing their assembly at Sanana by July 6th, tasked with advancing to their jumping off point at the Barike River line. The first units to land had already started this movement on July 4th, meeting only small Japanese patrols along the way. In the meantime, Colonel Liversedge's forces had successfully landed at Rice Anchorage on July 5th, 
immediately starting their advance south towards the Dragon's Peninsula. Yet the Japanese had also been able to land the remaining elements of the elite 13th regiment at Vila, with Colonel Tomonari Satoshi assuming command of the Vila defenses. With the successful arrival of reinforcements at Vila, General Sasaki would be able to move the troops by barge through Bairoko to reinforce Munda. Due to the American delays to launch their main assault against Munda, Sasaki had already brought his 3rd Battalion, 229th Regiment from Vila in this fashion. Although he was expecting a direct attack on the airfield, the early detection of the Zanana landings on July 3rd would also allow him to quickly reinforce his eastern line running north from Ilangana Point. Thus, by July 6th, he had two battalions manning the Ilangana line, with a company additionally setting up a roadblock position with felled trees and barbed wire in front of the barrique. Additionally, Sasaki would also reinforce the Kure 6th SNLF at Bairoko with a small detachment under Major Obashi Takio. At the same time, Wing had managed to bring the remainder of the 172nd to the mouth of the Barike, but the 169th still had one battalion on Rendover, while its 3rd battalion was moving inland in the direction of the Japanese bloc. On July 7th, the shaken and inexperienced 3rd battalion would attack the roadblock, but it would be repelled and would have to dig in for the night. That day, the bulk of the 145th Regiment also began to be transported to Rendover. Although General Hester's original plan was to begin the main advance on July 7th and to land the 3rd Battalion 103rd Regiment on Munda's west coast on July 9th, these delays would force him to cancel the hook around Munda and to postpone the offensive until July 9th. On July 8th, the Japanese bloc would finally be overrun, and by July 9th, the 169th had at last assembled at the Barike Line. Meanwhile, after a difficult march through rough trails and under heavy rain, Colonel Liversedge's forces had managed to cross the Tamakau River by July 7th. His plan was now for Colonel Griffith's first raiders, reinforced with two companies of the 145th Regiment, to swing right and take the west shore of Anogai Inlet prior to assaulting by Rocco, while the 3rd Battalion, 148th Regiment, advanced southwest to block the Munda by Rocco Trail in an effort to cut off Munda from reinforcements. It was estimated that the initial objective of both forces would be achieved by July 8th, as Liversedge's troops carried just three days' rations and one unit of ammunition. In the late afternoon of July 7th, the 148th's troops would manage to reach the trail, completing the camouflaged roadblock the following day. Concurrently, Griffith secured the villages of Marinusa and Tiriri, then engaging some Japanese patrols up ahead. Though their presence was discovered, the Americans would successfully capture a defense plan which showed the exact locations of the heavy guns at Inogai. On July 8th, after an inconclusive morning firefight, the raiders moved out along the trail towards Enagai, but were disheartened to find an impassable mangrove swamp. At the same time, Major Obashi launched a strong counterattack against Triri, but would be successfully repelled by the 145th's companies. The next day, Griffith resumed his advance against Enogai by using a good trail, apparently unknown to the Japanese, that led over high ground west of the swamp. Meeting no opposition, the raiders were in sight of Leland Lagoon by noon, but were soon stopped by two Japanese machine guns after swinging slightly to the right. The morning of July 9th also saw General Wing's main advance begin, covered by a heavy artillery, air and naval bombardment of Munda. Though slowly and cautiously, the 172nd Regiment would forge the chest-high barrique, successfully advancing 1,100 yards before digging in for the night. The 169th, however, did not move, with its shaken 3rd Battalion being relieved by the 1st as a result. That night, Admiral Samajima also sent the remaining troops that hadn't been landed on July 6th aboard four destroyers, with the cruisers Chokai and Sendai and another four destroyers covering them. Only getting harassed by a small American strike, the transport group would manage to reach Vila, unload and then return by the same route. At this point, Admiral Kasaka had also requested naval reinforcements from the combined fleet, so Admiral Koga would send Admiral Nishimura's 7th Cruiser Division to Rabaul, successfully arriving there by July 11th. 
Additionally, Rear Admiral Izaki Shunji would be sent to take temporary command of the reinforcement unit, bringing with him his light cruiser and a destroyer. Meanwhile, as the Kure 6th heavy gun batteries fired at Rice Anchorage, Griffith decided to send forward a strong patrol in the early hours of July 10th. This patrol reached Anogai Inlet without opposition, and reported that it had discovered a fairly good route to the point. At 0700, Griffith thus ordered his unengaged B Company to begin the assault, while his other forces contained the main Japanese positions. Supported by a barrage of mortar fire, B Company drove forward rapidly, cleared the village of Beikinaru, and captured two machine guns. Shortly after midday, the Japanese would begin to evacuate Inogai, only leaving behind some small pockets of resistance, but suffering many losses against the American machine guns. As a result, the raiders would be able to push over Anogai Point to the sea, immediately establishing beach defences and successfully clearing the area by July 11th. Though behind schedule, the raiders took Anogai just in time, as they had only recently run out of food and water. During this engagement, the raiders also suffered 131 casualties, while the Kure 6th reported 81 killed and one army platoon lost. These losses forced Liver's Edge to request the landing of the 4th Raiders for the final attack on Bairocco, though the reinforcements would not arrive until July 18th, and at the same time, Colonel Tominari decided to bring his 1st and 3rd Battalions to Bairocco in an effort to further reinforce Munda. These troops would then engage the American roadblock, temporarily overrunning their positions on July 10th, but then getting repelled the following day. The 148th Regiment would effectively hold the roadblock for nine days, although they would face a serious food shortage during this period. Nonetheless, their efforts would be in vain, as the Japanese would simply stop using the blocked trail and would shift instead to another one farther west. In the end, Liver's Edge would order the 148th to abandon the block and march back to Triri on July 17th. Meanwhile, Admiral Kasaka had decided to further reinforce Kolombangara with another 1,200 troops, this time from the 45th Regiment. Aboard the Jinsu, Admiral Ezaki thus led a force of five destroyers from Rabaul on the morning of July 12th in a covering role for the four destroyers carrying the reinforcements. As they made their run down the slot, however, the Japanese convoy was spotted by Allied Coast Watchers, so Admiral Halsey would order Admiral Ainsworth to head north to prevent the landings. Reinforced to a total of three light cruisers and ten destroyers, although half of them were inexperienced and would have to be hurriedly taught the battle plans and operating procedures, Ainsworth would set sail once again for the Kula Gulf during the afternoon. By nightfall, both forces were finally approaching Kolombangara. At 035 on July 13th, a PBY managed to report the course and composition of Izaki's force, so Ainsworth then prepared to intercept. As the two forces converged, Izaki sent his destroyer transport through the Vela Gulf, yet by 0100 he had also been alerted of the approaching enemy. Despite being detected first, the Japanese gained visual contact at 0108, so they would be the first to attack, launching a total of 29 torpedoes by 0114. Roughly at the same time, the American destroyers would also launch a concerted attack of 19 torpedoes, though this attack would fail because of the shorter range of the Mark 15. When the Japanese column closed to 10,000 yards at 0112, Ainsworth ordered his cruisers to open fire, concentrating on the Jinsu, which was leading. Immediately, the cruiser was set ablaze and Izaki was killed, the second admiral to bite the dust in these waters. Additionally, the Americans would launch a second unsuccessful torpedo attack at 0114, firing a total of 21 torpedoes. But at the same time, the Japanese torpedoes were finally arriving, and although the Allied ships began evasive action, the Leander would be struck at 0122, forcing Ainsworth to detach two destroyers to retire the crippled cruiser. At this point, the 1,200 Japanese reinforcements had been successfully unloaded, the destroyer transports were moving north to withdraw, and the remaining destroyers of Izaki's covering group were heading southeast to re-engage after reloading their torpedoes in just 18 minutes. The Americans, meanwhile, sunk Jinsu with a torpedo at 0145, and then headed to the northwest to pursue the enemy. 
Though the Japanese destroyers were detected by Honolulu's radar at 0156, Ainsworth doubted whether these were his own destroyers, thus allowing the enemy to fire another barrage of 31 torpedoes. The results were devastating, with both St. Louis and Honolulu getting hit and suffering heavy damage, while the destroyer Gwyn was struck amidships and would have to be scuttled. This essentially put an end to the Battle of Kolombangara, with Ainsworth desperately retreating to Tulagi with his remaining ships. Despite the loss of Jinsu, the undamaged Japanese vessels had managed to land their reinforcements, which would then move to reinforce Bairoko by barge, and had also inflicted heavy damage on Ainsworth's force. After this defeat, Admiral Nimitz realized that using cruisers to chase Japanese destroyers in the restricted waters of the Solomons was not working so he suggested to Halsey that his destroyers would have to fight alone in the future if they hoped to defeat the IJN at sea. Next week we'll continue with our coverage of the New Georgia campaign, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we've started releasing weekly Patreon and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.